Alessandro Zorzi is also an outstanding scientist from the Padua team. Is uh, the first uh, collaborator, let's say, from Domenico Corrado, and is actually the most author or most part of this uh, most recent uh, scientific uh, publication from this uh, team. Um, I ask Alessandro to to discuss at length the, about the arrhythmias, and yeah. so start with the ventricular arrhythmias. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for your kind invitation, and and. Of course, um, the ventricular arrhythmias is one of the most controversial topics in for cardiologists, and this is one of the uh, most common problems that you may encounter in the clinical practice. Of course, I cannot give you all the answers. I will focus on uh, uh, premature ventricular beats, which is the, the problem that the sports cardiologist faces more, most often. And my aims is first, of, uh, of course, what I want to do is to understand when you can deal with arrhythmias by yourself, when the, the arrhythmias do not, uh, and when you need a specialist evaluation. This is the, the main, my first goal. But my aims in general are to convince you that evaluation of ventricular arrhythmias is based on a multi-parametric approach. So you cannot just consider the number of arrhythmias on the altar monitoring, which is what many people do to teach you how to recognize the most common and probably benign ventricular arrhythmias from those that can be uh, pathological, and to suggest when you should prescribe a magnetic resonance, okay? Uh, of course, if there are questions, I will be more than happy to answer. So first of all, um, are premature ventricular beats a feature of the atlas heart? This is a, uh, a very important question. So there are many people that think that an athlete uh, is, does, not, do not does not uncommonly show premature ventricular beats. And in fact, in the current guidelines, you need two premature ventricular beats in an electrocardiogram to f trigger further examination. And if you more or less make a, a calculation, two ventricular beats in a 10-second 10, 10 HEG means, means more than 10,000 premature ventricular beats per day. So uh, current guidelines accept a very high premature ventricular balance in a heartlet because this is considered non-specific. In reality, if you go back to 80s and 90s study, they uh, compared, they, 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 they took some um, control atlas, I mean young, healthy atlas, and they performed a 24-hour alter monitoring, and they did the same thing in sedentary controls. And what they found is that the prevalence of a premature ventri uh, uh, one premature ventricular beat in a day is very common, but frequent premature ventricular beats are not common at all. And also, a very important thing is that the, the burden of ventricular arrhythmias in atrial and central individuals is the same. So you're not, at, at, the, at this time, until further um, studies, including the one that I'm doing myself, uh, will be available, uh, we are not uh, um, authorized to think that uh, premature ventricular beats are common and normal in athletes. And also because there is another interesting study that came from the group of Rome, and they had, uh, they evaluated uh, a number of athletes, of elite athletes, with um, premature ventricular beats, okay? And as you can see, there is no correlation between the degree of left ventricular remodeling, the left ventricular mass, and the burden of arrhythmias. So the question, the, you, you cannot think that an athlete is supposed to have premature ventricular beats in his electrocardiogram. So the problem is when you find an arrhythmia in heartless, uh, is to, um, if these arrhythmias are, are a sign of an underlying heart disease. In other words, ventricular arrhythmias can be idiopathic and benign. There are some people that have ventricular arrhythmias with a structure in normal heart, and, and we don't have any demonstration that these arrhythmias are harmful. The problem is that you need to exclude that there is an underlying disease that causes the arrhythmia. This is the problem. For example, this is a true case, 27-year-old cyclist with a normal baseline electrocardiogram, no family history of sudden death cardiomyopathy and no symptoms, okay? They perform a stress test, and during stress test, there is this couple, this ventricular couple, okay? So I think that the majority of you, the first thing they will probably do is to, to ask for an alter tape, right? Okay? So the alter tape just demonstrated for 100 42 isolated premature ventricular beats with no complex forms. So would you consider it reassuring? Only if it's, it's a very low arrhythmic burden, no complex forms. 
maybe some of you will just stop at this time. Let's, let's say we perform an echocardiogram, okay? It's normal. So at this time, with this data in your hands, you can just clear the athletes and say, okay, you had a, a couple, nothing happens. So we will come back to this case. So what is the parametric approach, the multi-parametric approach to evaluate an athlete with ventricular arrhythmias? First of all, okay, number and complexity. This is the traditional uh, parameter. And the tra this parameter derives from the work of uh, Dr. Biff here in Rome. Um, they uh, selected a court of elite athletes who were uh, evaluated because they show premature ventricular beats on the baseline of HG or arrhythmic symptoms. And as you can see, they categorized these athletes into three groups according to the complexity of the arrhythmias, the number and complexity. So the more complex and the more, and the compl the more complex arrhythmias, the different groups. And as you can see, the probability of having an underlying disease was higher in the group with frequent or complex uh, arrhythmias compared to the ones with rare arrhythmias. And also, uh, athletes with rare arrhythmias were clear uh, and no structural abnormalities were cleared for participation in the sport had a normal follow-up. So um, most of the uh, guidelines are based on these studies that were published in the early 2000s. And in fact, you will find in the, in the guidelines, for example, in the American guidelines, the 2,000 bits per day uh, cutoff to consider the athletes eligible or not. The problem is that uh, most of uh, idiopathic uh, premature ventricular beats can be very frequent. So there are people with arrhythmias coming from the right ventricular outer tract, which is the most uh, common arrhythmias, and we will see it later, that can show up to 10,000 uh, or, or more premature ventricular beats per day and still have no uh, underlying disease. Or on the other hand, you can have uh, people with cardiomyopathies with just hundreds, two hundreds uh, premature ventricular beats per day and still have a cardiomyopathy. So the, 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 new, the number of premature ventricular beats can, in a certain way, um, make uh, you have a higher suspicious, but, in, but per se is not important. The response to the training is another, uh, another um, feature of the arrhythmias, and again from the group of Rome. They demonstrated that people with athletes with arrhythmias and no uh, structural heart uh, disease tends to have a lower arrhythmic bound than if they detrain. So let's say, for example, a competitive rower with arrhythmias, you detrain him for a year, you, you, you perform another alter, and the arrhythmias tends to disappear. And this was considered uh, a sign of a, a benign arrhythmia. The problem is that also this data is controversial because, yes, it's true that with the training these arrhythmias tend to disappear, but later the same group published another paper in which they retrained. So they start, uh, the, the athletes start to train again, and the arrhythmias did not appear again. So the correlation between exercise and arrhythmias was not, uh, I mean, confirmed. And also there was another group on non-elite athletes uh, with arrhythmias. Some of them the train and some of them continue training, and they did not f find any significant difference in the arrhythmic burden. So again, this is another, another, um, uh, another element that you may, uh, have to take into, into consideration, but this is, this is not enough. The most important, in my opinion, element in evaluation of the arrhythmias in athletes is the morphology. Because the morphology tells you where the arrhythmia comes from and helps you to identify the most common and probably idiopathic arrhythmias from those that are more clinically suspect. And I, want, I would like you, also those of you who are not, uh, who are not um, an expert of electrocardiogram readings, to learn this particular kind of primatoventricular ventricular bit. Let's examine it in details. You have a lead V1, see? It is negative all negative. And this is similar to a left bundle branch block. In fact, this is called a left bundle branch block like premature ventricular beats. What does it mean? It means that it comes from the opposite side, from the right ventricle, okay? And also, you have to consider the axis on the limb leads. So as you can see, the um, high uh, positive QRS is seen in the inferior lead, shoot free and AVF. What does it mean? 
that this bit comes from the top to the bottom of the right ventricle. The top of the right ventricle is the right ventricular outflow tract. The right ventricular outflow tract and also the left ventricular outflow tract are uh, the origin of the most common idiopathic ventricular arrhythmia. So these cases, 99% of cases are benign. Okay? Another common uh, arrhythmia, and usually benign, and you can find it particularly in children, is the fascicular arrhythmia. In this case, you have a right bundle branch block pattern, so the QRS is positive in V1, so the arrhythmia comes from the left ventricle, but it is important that the QRS is very narrow, okay? As you can see, most of people think that this is an aberrant superventricular arrhythmia, but it is not because there is a dissociation between the P wave and the QRS. These arrhythmias come from the fascicle, so from the specialized conduction system, and are usually idiopathic and benign. So those ones are common and usually benign. On the other hand, this is again a left bundle branch block arrhythmia. You, know, you now can recognize the negative QRS complex in V1, but if you take a look at the leads 2, 3, and AVF, then the QRS complex is negative. So these come from the bottom of the right ventricle to the top, for example, from the apex of the free wall of the left, right ventricle. This is not a typical area where normal arri benign arrhythmias come from. So this is more, su more suspect. And the most suspect of all is the QR uh, white QRS right band batch block extra uh, premature ventricular beats. So positive in lead V1, so from the left ventricle, but not from the specialized conduction system, but from a normal myocardium. So QRS is wide. So this, this one is the most suspect, and I will tell you why. Of course, also morphology is very important, but he has to, take, to put into the clinical context. If you have a, a Again, a left bundle branch block inferior axis premature ventricular beat in an athlete with a negative T waves on the HCG, then of course you have to suspect that this uh, uh, premature ventricular beat is not that benign. But in general, morphology helps. Okay? Response to exercise is another important thing because, premature, because idiopathic and benign arrhythmias tend to disappear with exercise. Everybody of you that performs stress test knows that the, the premature ventricular beat from the right ventricular outflow tract usually disappear at the peak of exercise and appear again during recovery. Okay? So this is another important thing also because malignant ventricular arrhythmias, for example, those uh, related to arrhythmogenic myopathy, tends to, uh, to appear with exercise, to persist with exercise. Of course, this is not a strict rule. Uh, right ventricular outflow tract arrhythmias can also appear during exercise and also arrhythmias from, of the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy may disappear with exercise, but again, this is another element that can help you for differential diagnosis. Importantly, this group in Rome demonstrated that uh, if you have a, a arrhythmia during stress test with no structural abnormalities, the follow-up is good. So again, what makes the difference is not the inducibilities during the stress test, but the underlying disease. So key message. Exercise-induced premature ventricular beats may be more frequent in athletes with structural heart diseases, but if a substrate is excluded, there is no demonstration that they are malignant, although the Italian, legisla uh, the Italian law, the Italian protocol for eligibility, mandates athletes with persistent uh, arrhythmias during exercise test to be disqualified. So we don't exactly know the follow-up if they had continued training. Finally, in the more search for an underlying structural heart disease. So at this point, you have an athlete with an arrhythmia. You have to evaluate. Is it prob probable, is probably benign, or it is more suspect? You cannot use a single uh, element. You need to, put, you, to use a multi-parametric approach. Typically, benign arrhythmias are isolated, suppressed by exercise, reduced with, with the training, and the morphology is, suggests a right ventricular outflow tract or, or uh, fascicular morphology. On the other hand, if you find more complex or repetitive couplets, triplets, arrhythmias, if they are induced by exercise, if they persist with the training, the morphology is uncommon, then the suspicion is higher, independently from the, num independently from the number. Okay? Very quickly, investigation of underlying myocardial substrate. How deep should we dig? Is echocardiography enough? Th those are two um, 
two um, uh, very uh, popular cases. The first one is uh, an Italian professional athlete who died suddenly. The second is a former uh, Spanish athlete who had an arrhythmic syn syncope, and, but luckily is still alive. Uh, the first one, Pier Mario Morosini, has a left dominant arimogenic homeopathy, and we will hear about that tomorrow during my presentation. And the second one has this uh, new feature, which is a, a non ischemic left ventricular uh, late enhancement in the left ventricle. So this is probably a left or, or the sign, either the sign of an EL myocarditis or uh, a left dominant arimogenic homeopathy. The fact is that. Whatever the, the cause is of this myocardial substrate that can cause sudden death during sport, the typical arrhythmia is a right bundle branch block large QRS arrhythmia because this uh, disease uh, affects the left ventricle and causes, of course, arrhythmia coming from the left ventricle, so with the right bundle branch block morphology. Uh, I will skip this for the sake of time, but I, I can tell you that we collected um, 35 athletes who suffer ventricular arrhythmias with this scar in the left ventricle, and they all had a right bundle branch block type premature ventricular beats. So let's come back to the case of the beginning. So this, this is our cyclist with, no, uh, with a couplet, couplet in, the, in the stress test, uh, low arrhythmic burden in the alter monitoring, and echocardiography is normal. But let's come back to the alter monitoring. So it is a, he is an athlete, but he did not exercise during, uh, the, during the alter monitoring. So the alter monitoring in an athlete should include a training session, otherwise it's completely useless. And also it should be 12 lit. It should be 12 lit if it is possible, because then you can evaluate the morphology of the, pre, of the arrhythmia that you record with the alter. We perform a, 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 a 12 lead alter in that athlete, including a training session, and the ventricular arrhythmic burden was completely different. So polymorphic ventricular beats, typical, uh, specifically enduring exercise. This is a, a, an important information you can, can gain uh, with, from an alter. A resting free lead alter, in my opinion, is not uh, sufficient for an athlete. And also a cardiomagnetic resonance, he had a scar. Unfortunately, this athlete was not clear for competitive sport activity, but he decided to do a non-competitive uh, race, and he died suddenly with a demonstration of a left dominant arimogenic homeopathy, exactly the same phenotype of Morosini. So the take home messages for this very uh, intriguing and difficult topic is that first, the clinical significance of arrhythmias in the atlas depends on the presence of an underlying disease. This is the, the most important thing. The, second, some characteristics suggest a benign nature of the arrhythmia, but no single one is accurate for differential diagnosis. So you have to do a, a polymbariometric approach, okay? There is no demonstration that the ventricular arrhythmias in the atlas confer an increased risk of sudden death and should prong for qualification, provided an underlying disease is ruled out. But to rule out this underlying disease, often echocardiography is not enough. You need, at least in some forms, to perform a magnetic resonance. Thank you. Alessandro.